you've had a fun time fiddling with your new phones. <laughs> I'm Martin Fowler. This is Rebecca Parsons. My, we're both, and um, we'll be talking about some of our experiences and thoughts for the future about Google's App Engine, particularly the new App Engine for Java, uh, which several of our colleagues were able to spend some time experimenting with earlier this year and get some preliminary thoughts about. To begin with, I think we'll talk a little bit about who ThoughtWorks is, just in case you don't know. We're, uh, we are a company that builds applications for people, primarily. And we're about 1,000 or so people scattered around the world. And we do a variety of different kinds of applications. Some are in internal-ish style IT applications, such as one we worked on for with Caterpillar. We do some very public web-fronted applications, such as The Guardian Online, which is a, a well-known English language a newspaper and media source. We build products for other people. So in Shuacom, example, is a, a case where we built a product for a company that then sold it on to its customers, which are insurance brokers. And we do some products of our own kind. So an example of that is Mingle, which is a project collaboration and, and management tool. We use a range of different platforms and languages. I would say the vast majority of our work is either Java or .NET, probably slightly majority .NET at the moment, but there's a significant amount of Ruby that we do, and we also do smatterings of other little environments as well. We like to play with lots of different things. And our projects can be from about one or two people up to about a couple of hundreds, probably our biggest at the, mm -hmm. at the moment. So we have quite a range of different kinds of projects that we do, and quite a range of, of stuff that we work with. So the first part of the talk, I'm going to primarily lead off and talk about some of the experiments that we did with Google, Google App Engine. Um, we were in that kind of early see it before its released phase, and we were able to get some people to, to work with it. And then Rebecca is going to concentrate talking about some of our broader um, thoughts about the cloud. But, we're, um, and we'll, but we'll be interrupting each other as we go. Of course. <laughs> so we'll begin with the experiments. And essentially what we did with the experiments is we launched a bunch of people out to say, here's Google App Engine. You've got a few days, perhaps in between projects, or we managed to allocate some time. Experiment with some interesting stuff and um, tell us your conclusions. In fact, if you hunt around on the Fort Blogs blogs, you can find a lot of this kind of information. So a couple of people decided they wanted to play around with the Clojure programming language, um, which is built on top of Java. Uh, another guy, Ola Bellini, played around with JRuby. Ola is one of the main committers to JRuby, so he's a perfect person to do this. And one of our folks in India decided to work a little bit with the GWT and JDO and a more straightforward use of the Google App Engine. And uh, Paul Hammond decided, as usual, to do some really freaky stuff involving rich clients. His um, aim is to try and get rid of Flash and all these proprietary rich client stuff and instead have source downloaded through, um, in his case, uh, using pieces of either JavaScript or, in his particular preference, using uh, Ruby to execute on the client side. So we had a bunch of different interesting things to work with. I, th I believe Paul is doing something in the... Um, Sandbox. Sandbox tomorrow, <laughs> so certainly take a look at that. So all of this stuff really is based on the idea that, well, we have a cloud, and we have on that cloud Java. But from perhaps a couple of those experiments might have indicated, it's actually not really Java that's on the cloud. It's much more the JVM itself. And one of the consequences of the fact that you've got the JVM on the cloud is that you've got this ability to bring out alternative languages. And that was clearly, as you see, a part of some of the experiments we did, Clojure and JRuby. But there's a lot of other, of course, interesting languages that have been built on the JVM recently, all of which are potentially capable of running on the Google App Engine for Java. Why is this interesting to us? Well, it, I mentioned earlier on that we have got a significant proportion of projects that we've done in Ruby over the last few years, 40-odd um, projects um, that we've done in Ruby. 
And, and one of the things that I did recently as the basis for a talk that I gave at another conference was ask the question of the people who worked on those projects, which was really about productivity. Is it more productive to use Ruby than a more mainstream Java or C Sharp style stack? And we're talking here about, uh, about Java or C Sharp used intelligently. And that is not with lots of EJBs or BizTalk or other productivity destroyers. And the answer, um, in a broad sense, um, was what you see here. That, in fact, um, I can boil down this answer, in fact, to this pie, which basically says that a significant percentage of the people felt that they were at least 50% more productive working in Ruby than they were in Java. And that's a significant piece of information. And that's also a piece of information that lies into some of these other languages as well. But there are some important productivity benefits about using some of these languages that are built on top of a JVM, but not being Java themselves. And that's why uh, we're interested in the fact that it's the JVM that's on the cloud rather than just Java on the cloud. Now, having said this, let's be honest about this, most of the time, people who are going to be using this Google App Engine for Java are going to be using Java. I would, the vast majority, I would expect, would be cases of people using Java. But it's worth bearing in mind those other languages simply because of the potential productivity gains they can provide. Particularly since many of those languages are designed for a particular purpose, and it's not so much that Ruby is this great, wonderful language that's so powerful, but if you have, if you lessen the distance between what it is you're trying to express and the language and what's natural to express in that language, you are going to get productivity improvements. So if you need a general purpose language, great. If, if you can get by in a very specialized language because you have a very specialized problem, then the fact that we have the JVM here on Google App Engine means that we can use those more specialized languages. So, the headline news is Google App Engine takes Java and the JVM and puts it on the cloud. However, the JVM isn't quite all there as we know it. Usually for good reasons, there are little holes in the JVM, which means that if you just want to take some app that's been developed on Java, you can't just say, oh, let's just put the stack, copy the files and transfer it to the Google App Engine for Java and it will just work. It won't just work. There are definitely ish different ways you have to think about developing on the Google App Engine than you would on a more traditional enterprise Java style stack. And there are three areas that our experimenters highlighted as issue areas of things where you have to particularly bear them in mind. And I'm going to really go through these three areas as really the main conclusions from our experiments. Starting with testing. And testing is important to me personally and to most of us at ThoughtWorks because we are pretty anal about testing. Whenever we see ourselves writing any code, we always want to execute it through tests. It's become a, a major part of our discipline of development, and we do it partly because of the fact that it allows us to put systems in production with way less bugs than otherwise would be possible, but primarily because it actually makes us more productive. Although it may seem like you're taking a lot of time to spend a lot of effort in testing efforts, you make up that time hugely by the fact that you're not spending so much time debugging. And we think that this approach to testing is very important. And furthermore, it's a testing that we do at multiple levels. So you have JUnit style, Java unit test kind of levels that go on with a fairly tight loop, and then a longer loop that uses more functional or acceptance tests using tools like Selenium or Water or WebDriver if it's a web app, or other tools that we put together for non-web apps. But we have multiple layers of testing and these are automated tests. So that as a result, we can take any version of our system, we can compile it, automatically test it, and get some sense as to whether there's any bugs lurking around there. This is a very much a core way in which we work. And so the testing issues, any testing issues to the Google App Engine are very important. 
Now, when it comes to executing some code, you've got two basic choices in the Google App Engine environment for how you're going to execute the code. One is to execute it on the remote App Engine itself, on the, data, the Google data center. But also, you have the option of executing it in a local development environment, a sort of special development server that has been put together for testing purposes. Both of these environments have their strengths and weaknesses in use. The first thing about working with the remote application engine is you have to remember you're working with a somewhat thinner pipe than you're going to have with a local development server. And this is particularly important to you if you're running these um, fine-grained unit tests where you're typically wanting to be able to run a test suite and get an answer back in a matter of seconds. The fact that you actually have to get the code and ship it all over onto the uh, Google uh, system to be able to do that that just becomes a significant factor when you're wanting that degree of turnaround time. Then there's a couple of other red flags that you have to deal with as well. One is that in order to actually execute stuff on the Google App Engine, it has to start up a JVM whenever you want to fire things off. And that still is a significant bit of lag time that's involved. And again, in, in, the, in, in the course of what you have to do to get something on production, it's not that big a deal. But when you're trying to run a rapid rate of unit tests, then that startup time can be a significant factor in your timing. The other problem with using the Google App Engine is it's very difficult to actually do the classic running a set of unit tests. There's no real facilities there in order to be able to do that runner at the moment. It's fine if you're using some kind of more web-driven approach like Selenium or WebDriver or the like. But for just running a batch of unit tests, the, the App Engine isn't really suited for doing something like that at the moment. So the logical thing, therefore, is to say, well, we want at least a significant part of that testing to be done through the local development server. But yes, we have some red flags there as well. And they really boil down into two main problems. The first one, and I think the most serious one, is that the local development server isn't really an accurate clone of what's going on on the, on the Google App Engine itself. Um, all of our experimenters ran into little cases where things wouldn't work on the local development server, but would work on the, on the full Google set, setup. And that, of course, can lead to a lot of frustration, because then you're faced with the problem of, hmm, what do I do here? Do I code around the local app server, even though it's going to work fine remotely? Um, or do I have to disable certain tests because they're going to fail for effectively spurious reasons? And then, of course, you get the reverse problem where it's going to fail, on, where it's going to work on the local system but not work on the remote one. And you don't have to run into too many of those glitches before you begin to lose trust in the local development server. The second area uh, where you run into difficulty is in order to use Google App Engine effectively, you want to use a lot of the services that are packaged in with the App Engine. But of course, they're not going to run on your local server. So what Google does give you is a certain degree of ability to be able to stub those Google services so that you can at least run test cases. But the stubbing isn't always what you want. And the way things are set up makes it a rather difficult for you to actually put your own stubs into place, which a lot of the time is what you'd want to do. And that problem. Um, is one that will also exacerbate running the lo tests locally on the local development server. Now, the good news about a lot of those things uh, is the fact that they're, they're all fixable problems. You know, we, we, we pushed on the App Engine in a way that traditional, standard Java uh, applications probably wouldn't. And as we run into those, those problems can be fixed to make sure that, that the local clone is more and more in align with, with what the cloud is. So as, as we run into those things, they, they can be fixed. So it's something that we expect to continue to improve as, uh, as this product gets more, more usage and we have more opportunities to be able to, to push on this, in, in particular in the testing. We know that we push things in testing far more than other people do. And so we kind of expect things like this. <laughs> So there's kind of two messages with all of these three points. There's kind of two messages here, message streams here. One is to Google, and, and my message here to Google is 
get that local development server so it's a proper clone, make it so that you can easily um, replace those stubs. That's stuff that Google needs to do. And for people who are thinking of deploying on the Google App Engine, be wary about the testing. It's going to be more awkward for a while than we'd ideally like it to be. And probably a lot of the testing is ending up going to have to be driven through the App Engine, through the browser. You're going to rely on more of that than you would like when you prefer running local unit tests. There are things you can do to make sure as minimum amount of tests touch the, uh, the uh, tricky areas as possible, but you aren't going to be able to build as broad a unit test net as you would like, at least until the local development server improves its mirroring. So that's our message with testing. So it's the second topic to move into is persistence. Now, as you may know, Google provides a persistence mechanism for you called Bigtable, which is a very proven approach to handling persistence for this kind of cloud architecture because it's what Google uses for, well, Google search. And we know that that is battle proven with lots and lots of usage. And if you listen to the descriptions, and indeed the name Bigtable, you'll say to yourself, oh yes, tabular data structures. This is the kind of thing I'm familiar, rows and tables. I have row, a table with rows, and I have columns there. Except those columns can be in, in, given any arbitrary name that's some string. And not all rows of, there's no notion of rows of a particular type where the columns are all expected to be there because any row can have any column it likes. Hang on, this is not feeling like a table particularly. In fact, I, my view is thinking of big table as a table is just going to lead you mentally down the wrong path. What instead you have to say to yourself is what we have here is a nested hash map. We basically have some row pointer that gives you a bunch of, uh, uh, basically points you to a hash map with a bunch of keys, which itself gives you various bits of data. And a nested hash map is a very appropriate data structure for this kind of setup. Now, I don't think it's particularly coincidental that you look at a number of big web properties and they've moved towards a nested hash map style data structure um, for what they do. Amazon, for instance, also uses the nested hash map style model with its S3. But it is a different one to what most enterprise developers are familiar with because in the enterprise, relational databases rule supreme. Now, there's a bit more to the nested hash map story. We also have the ability in um, Bigtable to effectively have time-stamped versions of data for each of the keys that you have. Now, this is actually a potentially a very useful capability to allow the database to act in a much more temporal way and be able to record a history of information as opposed to just purely current snapshots. But again, this is a relatively unfamiliar thing for most of the developers that are used to developing with relational databases. Now, that's the underlying engine. If you use um, Bigtable, you will access it through various APIs. And there are three main APIs for accessing from Java. One is a data store API, and the data store API is the one that is really the most natural one to the underlying data structure. That is the one that gives you the feel, I'm talking to a nested hash map here. Then there are two higher level APIs, JDO and JPA, which are fairly standard Java-oriented APIs. You see them around a lot. And what that can lead some people into thinking, perhaps, is that, well, if we code our application based on JDO and JPA, or JPA, we don't really have to care about the fact that it's Bigtable as opposed to a relational database sitting behind the scenes. We can hide the fact that we're dealing with Bigtable, just write our application to those higher-level APIs, and all will be fine. You probably will hear people claiming that, maybe even people who claim that at this conference. I have a one-word response to that claim. Bollocks. <laughs> the thing with persistence that we've learned time and time again is that these abstraction layers are extremely valuable. They save you an enormous amount of effort, but they only provide that abstraction coverage to about 80 to 90% of what you're doing. There's always a certain amount of leakage 
with persistence APIs, when you have to go beyond the abstraction layer, and in a relational database case, you have to start talking SQL. Same thing is going to happen um, with big tables. Using the high-level APIs, you can kind of forget about Bigtable's existence 80 or 90% of the time. But a certain percentage of the time, you need to know you're talking to a nested hash map. And you have to deal with the way it allocates its rows across servers and clusters things together and things of that kind if you want decent performance. And we all tend to want enough performance that we're going to have to do this. This is going to be a big shift for a lot of enterprise developers. The relational database model has had enterprise development in a complete lock for a long, long time. And it's going to be a significant shift um, to move over to the nested hash map model. We have high hopes that it will happen. <laughs> we do. I mean, on the whole, we quite like this. Um, I think this is actually a good shift um, to go through. And I'm, I'm not going to advise Google to replace Bigtable with relational databases. I don't think that would at all be necessarily a good idea. But for you as users, if you're thinking of developing for App Engine, you have to think about that shift in persistence model. And that's one very big reason why you can't just port a traditionally developed Java app and just say, oh, we'll put it on App Engine. Because you're going to have to change your persistence model. And that is not going to be a small adjustment for most applications. So that's the persistence story. So the third topic to mention is concurrency. Now, the JVM has had a very particular model about concurrency right from the very beginning. And that is that you have one broad memory space of, memory of objects that you're dealing with in memory and multiple threads operating across that memory space. And you have the power to create new threads within that memory space anytime you like, and the responsibility to arrange all the locking and stuff so that you don't shoot yourself in the foot. The Google App Engine operates on basically a different model. It says that we actually have separate memory spaces, each of which only has a single thread operating in it. And you can't just create a new thread within a memory space and, it, and certainly not to let it access the same objects. If you want to communicate between these memory spaces, then you operate with a database. You operate with Bigtable. Now, there are lots of pluses and minuses here. The first thing is that notionally, the Google App Engine model of single-threaded applications communicating through a transactional database actually the way a lot of people tend to think about web apps normally. A lot of people are wary about shooting off threads left, right, and center because they know it can shoot themselves in the foot. So they tend to use a thread to handle a particular web request coming in, do everything all on at least logically a single thread, storing stuff off to a database or some other kind of um, session storage or whatever. So the shift there mentally in thinking from the traditional Java structure to the Google App Engine structure, that's not actually that big a shift not at least in the broad perspective. But there are details where there is an issue. Now, as I mentioned, one thing you can't do in the Google world is I've got a thread operating on some data, and I want to spin up a new thread. Do that, you get an exception, game over. And that's fairly obvious. I, can't want to, I, can't, I don't want to be doing that. However, there are cases when it's not so obvious. I'm running some application. I've got some thread going around here. I want to call some service on an API, some third-party li library that's part of my application. I don't really know very much about this third-party library, but it's going to do some useful work for me. So I call a method on there. And what I don't know is that that third-party library has spun up a thread without me knowing about it, and I end up getting an exception that I wouldn't expect. And that is, unfortunately, relatively common. Because everybody's used to the Java model of concurrency, people are fairly comfortable with the idea that they might be spinning up threads. And if you've got some third-party library that's going to do that, you're not going to be able to use it on App Engine. This also particularly hits people if they're using some of those la alternative languages I talked about earlier on. A number of those languages 
also do a lot of use of threads. In fact, part of the experimentation is to make concurrency more tractable. And so they do this spinning up of threads routine. And as a result, they're going to have more problems on the app engine because of that. So on the whole, the message to, program, to, to programmers there is you've got to be wary about what libraries you're using, what technologies you're using, to know about how they're dealing with thread management, to know whether you're going to be using them with a Google App Engine. But broadly, the concurrency designer App Engine leads you to these separate memory spaces with a single thread in each memory space is actually a model that I would much like to recommend to people. I think it's a much more tractable concurrency model to work with that kind of approach than the shared memory multiple threads kind of approach that the JVM encouraged. And again, over time, I mean, part of the power of the Java platform is the significant number of third-party libraries that are available. You've got libraries to do practically anything. Over time, as the uh, Google App Engine platform becomes more popular, many of those libraries will be ported in different ways, taking into account the fact that the thread model is now different. So this is a third message. This is to the people who are writing libraries, is to start thinking about this. Are you actually, do you really need to be able to be able to fire up threads, or can you make this functionality available to people who are using Java on, on the Google App Engine in such a way that we don't run up against some of those security exceptions? So that's message number three for this part. Yeah. So that's three broad areas that we've talked through. None of these, I would argue, are showstoppers. And they're all, re they're, they're all things that you've got to be wary of. Um, but certainly, the Google App Engine certainly looks like a reasonable platform. I, I'm not in the position yet to say it's definitely workable, because I'd like to see about half a dozen or so systems in production before I can um, say that kind of thing. And it's still too early for that. But it certainly looks like a reasonable platform for a lot of cases to use. And that's really the. Um, conclusion from our experiments and some of the thoughts from that. And so now I'll switch over to Rebecca to talk about the broader issue of enterprise considerations. So we tend to write larger apps, um, and our experiments kind of uh, pushed on that as well. We, we don't always write just tr traditional web applications, and we do deal with enterprises. And although you can say, well, there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of millions of small business people, why do we have to worry about enterprises? Well, there's still a lot of enterprise development going on out there. And in fact, what you'll find in a lot of these enterprises is all, there, are the, uh, there are the early adopters. There's a whole lot of people out there in that late majority and who really are quite wary of new technology like this. So there are basically three broad areas of uh, concerns that enterprises have with something like App Engine. We're going to start talking first about some characteristics of the App Engine and in really the space of different cloud offerings and how those different cloud offerings might, in fact, impact the way an enterprise thinks about experimenting in the cloud or moving into the cloud. Then I want to talk a little bit about some of the paranoia that exists in enterprises to understand why are these people so afraid? What's really wrong with this? And try to talk through uh, some ways then that we can start looking at how enterprises might get on an adoption path to start using this and overcome a little bit of their paranoia. So I want to start first by talking about the landscape, if you will, of cloud offerings. And I think it's important that you think about this as a line. And we've got some markers in this line at the moment which represent current cloud implementations. But there's a whole lot of space in there. And I think there's still a lot of interesting areas for innovation for people to start exploring the spaces between those lines. So in a very general way, we have our infrastructure clouds. Pure, bones, bare, infrastructure. Let's just have something out there. It places an awful lot of responsibility on the enterprise to handle things like system administration and all of that, but at least you don't have a server sitting in your data center anymore. So that's really the most general infrastructure. You've got an incredible amount of power, but an incredible amount of responsibility within your, within your organization. Amazon uh, is a good example of that. Next is the platform. So I'm going to give you 
something to play with on this infrastructure. I'm going to give you some restrictions. You're still going to have a fair amount of power. I mean, let's face it, JVM is still a pretty powerful platform to build on. But I am building something of a box around you. I'm taking on more responsibility as a cloud provider. You're giving up some control to me. Uh, so we've got kind of a middle ground here. Google App Engine is, is a great example of this one. And finally, we have the very specific. Salesforce.com is often considered the standard here. This is a very specific application that does a very narrow thing. I have very little responsibility when I'm dealing with Salesforce. They're handling virtually everything for me. I've got some knobs to turn. I've got a few things I can fiddle with. Yes, they have APIs. But for the most part, they're worrying about most everything. However, although I'm sure you could probably write a text editor in Salesforce, you probably wouldn't want to. So I am giving up some flexibility and some power, but that's the whole point. This is an application-specific cloud. Now, in particular, I think there's a whole lot of interesting space between the platform and the application, where we might start not having something quite as specific as Salesforce, but something that's more targeted to a domain. So we might start looking at things like statistical analysis clouds, where I still have something of a programming environment, but I have a much narrower domain focus than something that's general as the platform. So I think there are a whole lot of points in there that are still worthy of exploration as we start to understand how different kinds of enterprises, different kinds of applications can make use of the benefits of the cloud. So what are those benefits? Elasticity is the first one. You really don't have to think anymore about some of the characteristics of your application that you used to have to worry a whole lot about. The cloud will flex with your requirements, and you don't have to worry about it. And that's, that's important, particularly when you want to start thinking about introducing something into an environment that's as dynamic as the web. Who knows how popular something's going to be? You put it out your server could crash because you had no idea that you were all of a sudden going to be slash dotted. Whereas in this environment, that infrastructure can flex to meet your needs. To me, this is one of the most important. Low barrier to entry. One of the things that used to happen a long, long time ago when I didn't have so many gray hairs is you had a lot of interaction between the business user and the IT people. And someone could sit down and say, this is the vision of what I want to have happen, and the programmer was sitting there and banging it out. And now we have huge IT departments and all of this separation of requirements documents and all of this stuff. What we need to do is get business people and development people back together again. One of the nice things about the low barrier to entry of, of the cloud and Google App Engine is now my business person can come and sit down and say, I've got this idea. And you can put it together very quickly, very powerfully, put something out there. It's elastic. You can start to get immediate feedback from your customers on, does this really work or not? And if it's a good idea, then you can start to think about, so what else do I need to do to really make this enterprise ready? This low barrier to entry is, should enable a lot of innovation in the businesses where they can start trying out some of their ideas and throwing out the 9 out of 10 or 99 out of 100 that don't work. Pay as you go. To me, one of the most devastating effects of, of the last 15 years on the IT department is the fact that businesses started thinking of their IT departments as cost centers. And so they drove costs down. And then all of a sudden, they say to their CIO, why can't you innovate? And I can't innovate because you made me standardize everything because it had to be cheap. When you start working in this kind of environment with this pay-as-you-go model, you've got a lot more flex on your spend. You don't have to invest in a huge data center if you don't need it all the time. One of our uh, clients, for example, they're a retailer. Everyone knows when retailers make all their money. They spec all of their data centers so that they could lose 50% of their servers and still handle peak load with no more than 70% utilization. Just think of the waste of all those servers running the other 51 weeks out of the year. But that was what they had to do to stay in business. They had to pay all that upfront licensed hardware to handle peak season. 
in the pay-as-you-go model, you use that, you pay for only what you need to use when you need to use it. This is also wonderful as you're trying to get started, and I think it also is going to enable a lot of this innovation I was talking about, where you can start experimenting with things without having to invest in a massive data center to support something that you might not actually want to do. And economies of scale. I don't anymore have to worry about how much my data center costs me because I'm sharing all of my costs with everybody else. And we can have people who can be experts at these things. Let, let's face it, even a lot of larger enterprises, they don't have the wherewithal to have someone who's really an expert in Oracle and in WebSphere and in BizTalk and in SharePoint and on and on and on. And all of these enterprises, they have to pick and choose where that expertise is going to come from. You pull all those things together, and these cloud providers, they do have the need for those specialized resources, and we can start spreading the cost of that so I don't have to worry about it myself. And I don't have to make those hard choices of, okay, I'm not going to have an expert in this, and when I get into a world of hurt, then I'm going to have to go hat in hand to one of my providers and let them charge me ridiculous rates because I'm in trouble. So those are the kind of benefits. And you can see those benefits, and they go across that entire space, really, of different cloud offerings. Some of them affect, or have more of an effect, say, on the more application-specific one. But in general, these benefits accrue regardless of where you are in that continuum of clouds. This is also how I start to think about when is something no longer a cloud. If you don't have all of these capabilities, you're not really in the cloud. So that's really a framework of thinking about what the cloud is, is offering, what are some possibilities for when you might really want to use it. Now let's talk about some of these concerns for a minute. As I said before, there are a whole lot of enterprises that are far more on that late adoption part of the curve. They'll let somebody else experiment. You know, we know several people who would never dream of installing a piece of software until it was at least version 2.2. And I've had some who say, come talk to me when it's five. All those other ones, you know, they got to figure out lots of stuff before I'm going to risk my enterprise. This is the standard one. Security, privacy, and uh, intellectual property. These are all variations on a theme. But the first thing to realize is how many times when you hear on the news, yes, Somebody just got their database compromised again. You've got two million people who now have their credit cards canceled and have to call everybody because everybody has all their bills going to their credit cards now. You don't hear them talking about the fact that that data center was hosted by IBM or EDS. You hear it's the institution that lost the data. So here you're asking an enterprise with all of this value in their market presence to turn over complete control of something that valuable to a different organization. It doesn't matter who it is. They're having to turn this over to a different organization. And that's a scary thought for, for enterprises. Yes, they aren't perfect in protecting that, obviously, but at least they have control. And if their reputation gets trashed, they can fire someone. Yes, bye-bye, CIO. It's your fault. Um, I've got my sacrificial lamb. Now we can go back and start to repair the damage. Enterprises worry about things like that. And so they're going to be hesitant to turn over responsibility for something like that to someone that they don't have a really big stick to hold over. That's why a lot of those SLAs that, that are in these outsourced IT arrangements are so stringent. So the, the enterprises at least feel like they have a stick, even if, even if in effect they don't. And then privacy. Um, how is my data going to be protected? How am I going to ensure my customers that other people aren't looking at that data? Or how am I going to assure my CEO that my competitor can't get to my customer database? So all kinds of related items around just how secure is my data. I know if I've got it locked away in my data center, I've got it protected and I know what's happening to it. Now you're asking an enterprise to turn over what is arguably one of their most valuable assets 
to somebody else and let them take care of it. Next one I hear a fair amount is, is it really cheaper? You see all these wonderful slides and, okay, now we don't have to pay for software and we don't have to pay for hardware. Is it really cheaper? From an enterprise perspective, when you start to think about this, a lot of those other slides rely on the fact that pretty much everything's going to the cloud. All my email, all my document, all my collaboration, all my books, all of that stuff's going to the cloud. As soon as it's not all, you're still left with servers that you have to worry about. You're still left with ops people that you still have to pay. So how much of this stuff really has to go to the cloud before I start saving money? A lot of that's gonna depend on the shape of the enterprise, how much, what their other arrangements are, but there's still this nagging doubt. You know, I keep hearing this stuff's gonna save me money, and it never does, so why should I believe it here? I love this one but I'm gonna to have to reorganize my IT department, to which I say, good, you probably need to. <laughs> but let's face it, as soon as you start relying on something like the cloud, your needs internally are, are going to change a great deal. You might need different kinds of people. In fact, you probably will need different kinds of people, and that means you're gonna need a different IT organization. This is not bad, but organizations, some organizations just like to reorg just because because it's fun. They like to print new org charts. But these, these are pretty disruptive activities for an enterprise to take on. And so even though it shouldn't be that much of a problem, enterprises worry about things like this. And of course, at least the enterprise architects will have something new to do because they'll have to write a whole series of new standards. How do you use the cloud? Which one of these features can I really use? When should I use when should I really expose big table? What are my standards? Of course you need new standards. You're dealing in a different platform. This is not a barrier, but it's just another thing that an enterprise has to do. And the ever popular vendor lock-in. If I go to Google App Engine, well, then all of a sudden now they've jacked up the prices by an order of magnitude and I'm locked into my cloud vendor. You're not locked into a cloud vendor any more than you're locked into any other vendor in your space, and that hasn't stopped anybody from buying Oracle or anything else. So yes, it does mean that if you're on App Engine and you decide you want to leave App Engine, you might have to port something. I don't see how that's significantly different. So the theme here is, yes, there are barriers that a large enterprise is gonna have to get over there's probably some things in the security and IP space, particularly in demonstrating, not just through a legal document, but generating through tests or, or other activities where you might actually say, okay, I'm gonna go to one of the hacker conferences and I'm gonna put a bounty on somebody who can break into this system so that I can start exploring the vulnerabilities of my system so these enterprises can start to think, you know, if it's that hard to break into, maybe it is all right for them to start keeping track of my data. But in general, a lot of these things are just internal processes and changes that an enterprise is going to have to absorb. So, those are the concerns. So how do we recommend enterprises start to get over this? And I do think that a lot of them are going to start to try. You're not gonna see them putting their huge enterprise internal systems on their day one. Not gonna happen. But I do think there are several paths that they can take. And the first one is what I was talking about earlier. With such a low barrier to entry, I'm sure in many of these enterprises there are all kinds of people with really great ideas that just need the ability to start to deploy it. And what's the common refrain we hear? It takes so long for IT to do anything. Well, a forward-thinking CIO would say, well, let me start to use this and some of those ideas that the CEO keeps tossing at me, start to experiment with some of this, I can get quicker turnaround, and I can start to provide value back to my enterprise, as well as I can start to get comfortable with this thing called App Engine. Big ticket, single shot. One of the most uh, more compelling stories I heard at uh, QCon last year was the description of a data migration. Massive amount of data. 
they would have had to buy huge servers to make this work, and they ran it in the cloud, and it cost them about $20. Now, yes, that means some of this very valuable enterprise data has to be out on the cloud for a little while, but you're not leaving it there for very long. I can maybe get behind that, particularly if you tell me I don't have to buy a bunch of servers or rent a bunch of servers and set them up and tear them down and all of that kind of stuff. So I think this is another one where there's very high value, single or non-recurring um, application runs where, again, you can start to demonstrate, okay, this thing really does work. I'm starting to get a rhythm within my enterprise of making use of this new kind of computational asset. Focusing on what matters. This is particularly important for smaller organizations, and you hear it in enterprise speak, focus on your core competencies. Why should an enterprise that's trying to spin up a completely new line of business have to worry about things like data centers? They don't worry about plumbing. They don't worry about the cleaning help. Some of these activities are at that utility or infrastructural level. Let's not let my creative types and my management bandwidth go at managing something that someone else can take care of. Let me focus on things that are, that are important to me. What's my differentiator in the marketplace? How am I going to address my customers? How can I have this better relationship with my customer? That's what enterprises ought to be focusing on, rather than thinking about things like a data center. And this is also, uh, uh, we see a considerable intersection between cloud computing and agile software processes. Uh, we've been very heavily involved in agile software processes. We've been doing them since um, the very early days. In the early days, we kind of had to do them in secret. Now we're doing them much more visibly. And there's a number of areas, I think, where the cloud can help us with this. One particular area is looking at how it affects our work in deploying into production. Uh, we are quite used to the fact that we regularly deploy applications into production and roll them over every couple of weeks or so. Even a fairly big project like The Guardian Online, we may have 40 or 50 people in the development team, but we're redeploying into production every couple of weeks or so, or sometimes even more frequently. In that kind of situation, um, deployment can be a real pain in the neck. For a cloud system, this can actually make things a lot more straightforward because we have uh, the kind of infrastructure that allows us to deploy quickly into the cloud, often not with some of the hassles that we might have from some of the IT departments we've known over the years. Another very interesting uh, property of using the cloud here is to enable testing. I've commented about the fact that testing is actually a bit of an issue at the moment because of the difficulty of getting that um, local test server. But one area where the cloud can be really nice is it doesn't cost us very much to spin up as many instances as we want to be able to run tests. And we find this at the moment with our Mingle Projects collaboration tool. Um, it's written once, but then it has to deploy on various different operating systems, the Mac, Linux, Windows, various flavors of Windows. Now he's got to work on all of these browsers. He's got to work on Firefox and Safari and Chrome. And it's got to work on that big browser that they didn't mention this morning that they make up in Redmond. And some old versions of that can be a little bit tricky. Now you just do the math of the combinatorial explosion of all of that, and that's a hell of a lot of servers. You need to run tests. Perfect case of the cloud. Spin them all up, run the tests, and you get rapid feedback. And of course, rapid feedback is the key to what you want in this kind of testing. And of course, the businesses who are always frustrated with how slow IT departments are, well, this gives you a much easier route to work around. Now, we, we've actually gotten fairly adept at getting around corporate IT departments with some of the uh, client relationships that we've had. But that's a whole lot more difficult for a marketing manager and such. And with something with, again, the low barrier to entry that, some, that Google App Engine has, now this person has the ability to work around IT in the way they haven't had to before or hadn't been able to before because IT owns the passwords and they own the servers and they own the firewalls and all of these things. You've got a lot more power that is being pushed to the various business units working in this model. And this is an area of history, of course, teaches us something interesting. All of those kinds of concerns that were being talked about, they might sound kind of familiar to those of you with gray or little hair in, in the way that we are, because we kind of heard this argument before. 
This is, I think, a point that Tim Bray pointed out really well on, on his blog. This was exactly the arguments against the use of PCs. IT departments saying, oh, we can't have PCs. They're never going to spread for all these kinds of reasons. Well, draw a lesson from history. And the ever popular quick and dirty, but in this qu case, quick and not so dirty. You can actually get some of these things up fairly quickly and still maintain a fair amount of development rigor and discipline. So yes, I'm sure it's possible to write something very messy and awful and unmaintainable in Google App Engine, just like you can in every other development platform known to man, and even every one that's probably st still to be written. Uh, but you do have, the, have some pretty powerful tools available that will allow you to put something up quickly, but not have to make a lot of the compromises that we often have to make. And how much capacity do I really need? The number of times I've been asked by clients, well, can you tell me what my data center capacity needs to be? Well, can you give me an accurate business forecast for the next 18 months on what all of your activity at any given point in time is going to look like? No. This, is, this uh, same graph was the one that was shown this, this morning in the keynote. This is the load that was put onto the server at when, uh, Obama's, uh, when Obama's town hall was done. Now, think of what the poor data center ops person would have to do to be able to have that peak that's half an order of magnitude greater than where that normal line is down at the bottom. You're going to have an lot, awful lot of very nervous people running around. And you probably had to have, once again, built a data center that could handle that capacity. That is if you actually thought about it far enough in advance to be able to, to provision it. When you have no idea what your profile is going to look like, you have no way to plan a data center. You don't have to in this model. And it can be throttled. So back to those, that poor retailer who had to build the huge data center that sat idle for most of the year. You can, you can run at your base level for the vast majority of the time, and it's only ratcheted up when, when you need it. Through quotas and other things like that, you could even control this yourself to make sure that you, uh, resources are being utilized properly. So you have a lot finer control over what your IT spend is, and so the CIO can start focusing on doing interesting things rather than just keeping costs down. So those are the kinds of ways that I can see even some of the more conservative enterprises start to think about using this, OK? Well, let's, let's let loose my marketing department. We need new market share right now. We need new ideas. The expectations from customers are tremendous. So let's enable some of these people to start coming up with some of these ideas and deploy them in the cloud. Or some of these testing applications Let's make my application more solid so, again, my customers won't be as unhappy. These are the kinds of things that enterprises will start thinking about and feel, start to feel comfortable using this strange thing called the cloud. So that's our uh, prepared text, as it were. We have a little bit of time left for questions. So if you've got them, please do. But come up to the mic so that the uh, cameraman can capture your question for prosperity. Okay, go ahead. Hi, um, I have a two-part question. First part is, um, I know you've been working a lot on domain-specific languages, uh, DSL, and I would like to know it, if it has a parallel with what you're doing with the Google Apps Engine. And the second part of my question is, um, just as Salesforce uh, has moved to the cloud, will ERP systems um, move uh, to the cloud as well? either with Google Apps Engine or some other uh, system? Do you see them moving to the cloud? Thank you. Oh, two very different questions. Um, you take it first. Yep. So if you go back to that, that um, infrastructure platform application-specific space, I actually see DSLs playing in that area between the platform and the application space, where you would start to see those specific languages being uh, constructed to enable a, a narrower range of development to go on on those specialized clouds. So I see there's a lot of potential in that space there for people to start putting up, again, domain-specific uh, application platforms in the clouds, leveraging things like DSLs. 
and also I think there's another interesting potential synergy in the DSL space is one of the on the edge interesting things in domain specific languages is a class of tools called language workbenches, which are basically tools that allow you to build your own DSLs and editing environments that go with them. Um, those are actually very well placed to try and provide you the abstractions that will allow you to deploy to a cloud environment with a little bit more hiding of what's going on. And, and that could be quite interesting because of the fact that you've got a new tool and a new deployment environment. That's shaking up the world enough to, I think, the two could actually go quite interestingly together. On the second question, will the ERP vendors be moving to the cloud? I would expect so, certainly. I mean, it's going to be... I can't imagine why, if you're going to build in and bring in an ERP vendor, you're not going to want to just shift all of the managing of the data center over to a company that specializes in it. I mean, the historic route is you get these specializations of activity, and I don't see why running data centers is any exception. I would be very surprised if in, say, 10, 20 years, we still see significant data centers held by um, companies, because I think that specialization will come. The, the greater complication there is so many enterprises have customized their SAP or their PeopleSoft implementations to be very specific to their business processes. And the, the effort that it would take to migrate those into a cloud environment, unless they still have all the same kind of knobs to turn as they have in a standalone uh, ERP implementation, you're probably going to see a, a, a great deal of, of pain in the migration process. But I agree with Martin. It is going to happen. It's just a matter of time. There are fewer knobs to turn in things like the CRM environment, and I think that's why um, the adoption from the Salesforce uh, in, into Salesforce has, has been greater than you might have expected otherwise. If you think about it, that's a pretty valuable enterprise asset. On the other hand, you know, the, the typical sales cycle doesn't vary as much. When you start looking at ERP, uh, it, it's going to be a more complicated problem. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, I have two quick questions. Um, I'm relatively new to the concept of a generic uh, hash map becoming a kind of a conceptual data store. Um, and so I'm interested in, um, in the relational database world, we're really used to being able to index tables in all kinds of different ways and access data and all kinds of different uh, keys. Um, does that mean that in this uh, type of uh, data store, we'll just have to duplicate the data and just use different hash key for different access? That's one, one uh, question. The second one is whether you've had any luck with JRuby and Rails in the App Store. Um, so uh, you can still link stuff together pretty well using the notion of the, the nested hash maps because as, so, as long as you can get at the keys and you know the path through the nesting, you can put things together. It is a different way of thinking to relational. It's not an easy way to kind of sum, sum up the difference in thinking, I'm afraid. It's one of those things that you have to practice in order to get used to. Now, the second question I didn't quite catch. Oh, it was uh, whether you had any luck with JRuby and Rails on App Engine. Um, well, Ola will talk all about this tomorrow. He's got a whole talk on uh, JRuby, <laughs> so we'll leave it to him. Hi, I have a couple of questions. First is about, uh, you talked about migration for a little bit, and, uh, uh, and you talked about the lock-in of the Google App Engine that exists, or of any cloud platform. Uh, do you think the notion that it's difficult I mean, it's, it's more difficult to come out of a platform than a database like an Oracle is because lots of people have done, I mean, like a migration from Oracle to some other database, but nobody has really tried out, like migrating an application from Google App Engine to some other uh, framework. And my second question is regarding the adoption uh, section of your talk. Uh, you talked about a number of compelling reasons. Which one in your understanding or experience do you think will be m the most compelling for the enterprises to actually make the move or start making the move? Okay, so on, on, the, on the first one, clearly um, migrations that have been done before are, are easier, and I do think there is some aspect of that, just like with the libraries. You know, people haven't rewritten the libraries yet to deal with a different con concurrency model. That will happen over time. I think you will get more tools to support these migrations. 
This is a little more complicated because going from relational to relational, at least you're staying within the same conceptual model. You do in this, in this world have to think about applications differently, or you, you at least should think about applications differently. So the migration will be more complicated. As time goes on, I think we are going to start to see more and more tools that are available for these kinds of things, which will make it easier. Uh, so it, a, a, lot of, a lot of these issues that we're raising, it's not, a, it's not a fundamental flaw with the platform so much as the tools haven't caught up. And we've been building tools for Java for years, for all of these other languages for years, and we're going to do the same thing here. As for the adoption, um, what I would like to say is it's that ability to innovate, the, the flexibility of being able to let loose the creative people within an organization to start coming up with new and better ways of doing business internally or interfacing with our customers and such. And I think that's a very compelling reason for a lot of enterprises. They complain constantly about how slow IT is, how long it takes to get anything done. So I think that should be a very compelling reason for an enterprise. Um, I think they're going to be focusing a fair amount on cost. Yeah, I think, I mean, again, drawing lessons from history, a lot of the people who are getting into things like PCs started by effectively trying to end run around IT departments where you've got some business people and some technical people who need to get something going and get something operating and don't want to deal with the bureaucracy. And I suspect that's going to drive, because let's face it, it, by definition, it's going to be the early adopters that are getting into Google App Engine uh, at the beginning, and they typically do that kind of end running behavior. And most of our clients, they're not ready for playing around with this stuff in broadly yet, but you'll always find most large companies will have a few little bubbles of people that have got something and are prepared to run with it, and they will tend to do this for innovation-driven reasons, I think. Okay, and we're getting close to time, so if we can cut off the line where it is. <laughs> right, so my question is more around the enterprise adoption, sort of a follow-on. Um, I think, you know, large corporations actually understand and realize the benefits of what cloud computing enterprise development in the cloud can do for them in terms of faster, better, cheaper, and there are typically mandates of those organizations from CIO down to the organization, how do we innovate? How do we be more, uh, uh, you know, faster and do things cheaper? And I agree with most of the analysis, you know, in the, in the talk, of, earlier part of the talk about adoption, with exception of the last part, which was really talking about working around IT. And I guess my question back to you is, with, with all this pressure uh, from a financial perspective and a need to innovate, you know, instead of working around IT, is it not the time to actually figure out how to capture the hearts and minds of IT, to actually transform the company? And I understand the historical perspective, but now, I mean, you know, there, there's just so much pressure to change, and the tools are so different. So I guess it's just a, you know, is, is it not the time to actually capture their hearts and minds? I, I actually think it is, and I, I think we're going to see IT departments that look very, very different, and that could be a very long debate. But, but I do think what you're going to start to see is a separation of an IT department into the very infrastructure-focused layers, which should be cost-driven. And that area of an organization that needs to be more dynamic and more responsive and therefore closer to the business. And I think once you start thinking about IT and separating those things, rather than trying to manage this heterogeneous mass in the same way, you can focus on enabling the innovation and enabling the rapid change within your IT organization, which might end up then getting dispersed a little bit more, while you can focus the cost savings on the things where it really just is plumbing. Um, and so I, I think you're going to start to see more of that. And I do think there is increasing pressure on organizations to, to start making those changes. Last question. Hi. Not, not a question, actually. Um, just picking up on the fact that there are two questions related to migrating applications built on top of relational databases to the App Engine data store. I'm giving a talk tomorrow at 1.15. It's called The Softer Side of Schemas. And this is, we've got about a third of the talk devoted to strategies for moving applications on and off uh, App Engine. So if this is of interest to you, please stop by. Sorry to hijack. And, and which, which track are you in? Uh, the App Engine track. Okay, yep. very good. App Thank Engine you. Track. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.